Today is October 10th, 2023. Welcome to Native Calgarian. Oki Naganago Meko Che Chestakom Aki or Dekot Nagotine Siku. Hi, my name is Red Thunder Woman. My married English name is Michelle Robinson, and I use she and her pronouns. I honor the Blackfoot as the elders have been kind to me on my Red Road journey. Elder Red Crane taught me how to pronounce my spirit name in Blackfoot, and Leonard Kenny taught me how to pronounce my name in Satu Dene. My humblest apologies to the Blackfoot and Dene elders and language keepers as I try to learn proper pronunciation. My Dene lineage roots me in the land of the Great Bear-like tribe in Treaty 11. My people wore rabbit skin, so it's often been referred to as the land of the hare people. I'm a native to Turtle Island, and my Dene nation is a visitor to this area of Klincho Tine Indahe in Satu Dene, meaning many big dog town, named after the Calgary Stampede. I was born in Calgary or in Blackfoot, Mokinstis, as Michelle Elliott, an English name which has afforded me privilege in an English colonial world. My mother is Northern Slavey Dene or Satu Dene, but my Indian Act and Post status card by the uh, Canadian government says Yellow Knives Dene. Through my father, I am a daughter of the Mayflower and a daughter of the American Revolution while having a Canadian Indian Act and Post status card. That is a legal construct uh, constructed by Canadian policies meant to divide Indigenous people's inherent rights. Indigenous Two-Spirit or the Indigenous 2S LGBTQ community and Indigenous women are at the bottom of the Canadian socioeconomic ladder because of colonial trauma, imposed poverty, racism, gendered violence, and land theft. According to the 2023 Quality of Life Report from the Calgary Foundation, 31% of racialized Calgarians can't even find suitable em uh, employment. So I do not speak on behalf of all Indigenous, but I can share my journey. As a Dene woman who has attempted to run, joined harmful parties, spent money to be at expensive conventions, left home to travel the, to those conventions just to vote on incomplete policies that still allows incarceration, a denial of justice, a denial of health services, racism, colonial trauma, and genocide of Indigenous and Black peoples, I have worked to continue reports to advocate for and attempt to work within these systems meant to harm me and my community. I think of all of this today, and I hope we honor the many uh, lives lost, both, both Black and Indigenous, for this so-called country named Canada. I hope you see your role in the importance of stopping harm, and as a citizen, see your role in reconciliation and as a treaty partner. Pride Month should never be one month. It's important to understand that the straight agenda and gendered violence was and is forced on these lands by Christian outsiders. And now we're using other religions to use that hate against folks. Um, land acknowledgements are critical for creating a safer space for Indigenous, as well as honoring the ghost as a host, uh, uh, honoring the host as a guest and acknowledging your role as a treaty partner in a so-called time of reconciliation. It's important your land acknowledgements have meaning. And if we're seeing anything with the Palestine issue right now, people don't get what those mean at all. I encourage all folks to introduce themselves with an acknowledgement of their ancestors, story of displacement, how you perceive your role as a treaty partner, a citizen of Canada, a refugee, or other land displacement. So we as Indigenous peoples know how safe you are to be around. If you won't pronounce your local Indigenous nations names, you won't say your own pronouns. You won't say your story of origin, you won't acknowledge stolen lands, imposed economic oppression, or your role in reconciliation. I determine how safe you are to be around my community, myself, and my family. Understanding land acknowledgements and their importance is Indigenous 101, because it immediately addresses colonialism, oppression dynamics, broken treaties, and lies taught today in Canadian schools nationally. That's why settlers and those who call themselves native Calgarians or whatever town you're from show me you have no Indigenous 101 understanding. Jesse Winty's book Unreconciled explains it perfectly, as do many Indigenous authored books. Land Back is a movement that could save the planet from climate change created by capitalists and, and colonialism, but it would also be an understanding of treaty partnership, part of meaningful reconciliation, honoring global initiatives like the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. So again, if you understand this undrip is what I call it, you would understand who the Indigenous peoples of certain lands are and why maybe our government officials speaking on behalf of us is exactly wrong, unless they're just so pro-settler, which is what we're seeing. Um, I'm speaking to you on the lands of the Nitsitapi, which is the Blackfoot Confederacy. The Blackfoot south of the imposed U.S.-Canadian border are the Blackfeet, 
North of the border are the Siksika, Gainai, and Bugani. These lines are Treaty 7, signed September 22nd, 1877, with signatures that include the Blackfoot Confederacy, the Wesley, or well, the now Good Stony, Chiniki, and Bears Paw Nations of the Stony, and the Dene from Sutina. I acknowledge all First Nation, Métis, Inuit, status and non-status across Turtle Island as the keepers of these lands. All non-Indigenous are treaty partners with the government signing on your behalf. My Patreon account is Native Calgarian, where you can pledge in support. Thank you, previous donors, for showing your support. If you value listening or watching and can afford to give, thank you. If you cannot afford to give, I'd just love to hear from you at nativeyyc at gmail.com, where you can send in your comments or questions. You can also give a review, whatever medium you're listening to, and I have a YouTube channel that you can go and subscribe. Go to nativecalgarian.com for the latest podcast uh, to have me come to your um, company or whatever it is that you want to do. So I want to welcome my returning guests. Speaking of people I feel safe with and that I can, you know, have around my family and myself, I'm, how would you like to introduce yourself today? Uh, I guess it's Carla Marks, sure. Hi, <laughs> Carla. A lot of names. It's hard to keep track. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, that's important, though. I and I, uh, the best part about these uh, Zoom meetings is that even though I see your name, it's not on the finished product. So it works out really nice for oh. when folks want to use a different name and and maybe in in your case a stage name. So that's great. Yeah. Yeah. It's been a, it's been a wild time. I'm Carla Marks. Uh, I'm a uh, a visitor here on these lands for the Blackfooted Confederacy. Um, I I am obviously a performer around Calgary and I do a lot of land acknowledgements. Uh, you know, weekly I'll do uh, at least a half dozen every week. And and I I watch people tune out. I watch people have heard them and you know, you're out there and I'm and I'm asking them, I'm trying to give them resources, I'm trying to give them ways to help get involved and engaged. And it's hard because people don't see Indigenous causes as a part of their own. They're so wrapped up in their daily lives. They're so wrapped up in, in trying to survive in this wild circumstance, set of circumstances we have going on right now, that it's, it's shrunk people's empathy circle. And there are so many people who want to. There are so many people who are sympathetic. But it's it that I find that great challenge is getting people from, I, I, I hear you and I've been I'm sympathetic to taking action and it's something that i think all marginalized groups that are asking for help and asking for solidarity right now are facing where it's it's increasingly hard to get people to do that because people feel so stressed thin and so overwhelmed with just getting by that it's like okay i need you to come take on this other thing too and getting people to see that that's not an external thing especially when it comes to indigenous causes it's 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 here it's local it's ours we have to take it on as treat as good treaty partners yeah exactly that's really tough i um i was really struggling especially after yesterday uh because you know of course i stand with all indigenous people globally and yet sure. when one of their speakers is an anti-queer uh speaker i'm like i i i don't i'm struggling right now because in theory practicing solidarity with indigenous people i can do that maybe online but now I know I cannot do it in person. It's been ruined. And um, and I can't amplify local uh, activists now because if they're anti-queer, then they're not, I can't amplify them at all. So I've been really struggling yeah. with that. And and conversely, and your community especially has been freaking hit hard. Um, like we're talking <laughs> two to three uh, hate rallies a freaking week. And, and no other yeah, place okay. in the country has that like us. Yeah. It's it is very tough, but it also highlights, I think, uh, it highlights intersectionality as a concept because I think a lot of people who are waking up to the idea of intersectionality view it as like a way to to pull together allies who share, you know, experiences from marginalization and discrimination. It also can pull together weird people who want to oppress that in weird ways you know like it can pull together people who have power and privilege in some instances discrimination in others and then there's these very tangled webs that are are very difficult to parse apart and you'd be like okay I, I want to support a free Palestine but some of those groups are supporting anti-queer speakers so I have to find a new way to do that and stand by principles and that can 
can be like really difficult to do because on the one hand you want to listen to Palestinians you want to listen to groups from the Middle East that are calling for self-determination and the rights for a free Palestine and then on the other hand you're like but we also want to subjugate these other people and we're like well that's not that's yeah. not great. <laughs> no, and, and I <laughs> think too, like either. I talk a lot about that internalized trauma, especially where, you know, um, it me as a as a as a native woman could really be hateful and judgmental more so to a native woman more than anyone if I haven't kind of unthreaded that unpacked it a bit within myself and uh you know so I, like when I see misogyny coming from from other women it sucks when I see uh white women you know being racist and misogynistic it sucks because they get the jobs that are considered considered diverse and like are yeah. so entrenched in toxic male culture, right? So like like you see that in many different ways. And then, um, you know, I was really offended yesterday that the NHL came out and said, okay, we're no more pride tape. We're not going to do that anymore. And I'm like, you bunch of misogynistic, like from my point of view, I've been thinking about that too and wondering, okay, so our laws don't discriminate and like literally this is a statement of discrimination literally so now what are we going to do because i like i ran for city council and i seen how toxic and awful this whole conversation was about getting a new arena and how the nhl gets to yeah. basically demand whatever they want and along with developers and uh, they get whatever they want we pay the bill for them to have their uh, money made and then now, you know, federally, are we going to go after the NHL and, and say, okay, that's discriminatory. That goes against our laws. <laughs> well, well, you and, and I have, go and ahead. It's, and it's wild because it only, there was maybe, I think there was 12 or 14 players that said they didn't want to do it. That's it. And there's, you know, 32 teams, there's 25, 30 guys on every, on each team I know NHL players who are very sympathetic to the cause, who are not just allies, but are true, are true, you know, supporters. They're, they're guys who really get it and wanted to play an active role in the community. And and it's so wild to me that the the avoiding controversy wins with a dozen guys push around the other seven hundred. Mm -hmm. And where I'm asking is, well, where is the NHL Players Association? standing up for the right for players to express themselves mm -hmm. it's wild to me that the idea of like well we don't have a controversy so we'll just ban queer discussion but i um i'm pretty sure that they're still going on with their plans to honor the military and to honor the police those aren't considered divisive even though there are many people who say these groups are very harmful historically to other marginalized groups who don't want to necessarily go and see the rcmp honored you know, at a at a hockey game, um, but we can't have pride tape or you know a, a a rainbow jersey or things like that because it might upset a handful of people. I and know. that's so really gross. shameful. And I yeah. also I also do blame I also do blame the media for quartering controversy. Um, you know, media obviously plays an important role in society of creating an informed electorate to make decisions but it also is a commodity and exists to sell itself and stoking controversies, having these two sides, having them seem extra extreme and there's outrage, uh, you know, sells papers. I mean, if anyone buys a newspaper anymore, I guess it gets them ad clicks online or something. Sure. Um, you know, and so they're, they're trying to, to sell a product and this product is controversy yeah. and they figured out that that obviously sells very well. And it, and it's sad because they're playing games with human rights. And then you talk to reporters when the camera's not rolling and they're all appalled at what's going on. I do interviews all the time about what's going on with the queer community. And they're so sympathetic. They're so outraged at the protest against. And then those same reporters will put out articles later that obviously get edited by a, a lot of people. And, and, you know, they're both sides the issue and they're giving lots of play to the people who are who are expressing this hate and I, and I feel like the covering of these controversies and the manufacturing of the controversy like if you ask a person okay 700 people are totally cool with this issue and 14 aren't who would you listen to the 14 or the 700 you know like no one's getting hurt 
the 14 people don't have to put rainbow tape on their sticks. Everybody else wants to. Yeah. You would say, okay, if you don't want to, don't do it. But why would you legislate that the other guys can't to make the people who are uncomfortable with queer people happy? And I, that's why I feel like it has a, a huge lens towards the media, because I don't think it's really about the 14 guys who had their own convictions or fear of reprisal from actions and, you know, for family members in Russia or whatever their justification was. I don't feel like it's really about those guys. I feel like it's more about the media covering and the National Hockey League not wanting to be at the center of a controversy or be reported on in this way and have to answer questions about like, hey, how homophobic is hockey culture? Because yeah. they want to just put a PR campaign on this and say, we're supportive. But if anybody pushes back, they they fold on this. Like, that's not support. That's that's just, vir that's virtue signaling. Absolutely. Totally. I'm really angry about the whole situation because, you know, um, I remember the misogyny being uh, downplayed my entire, like, lifespan. And then well, I was around when the Graham James controversy came out with Sheldon sure. Kennedy and oh, I, I and, the, and the whole trial. And I, I cannot wrap my brain around how they don't want to fix this, uh, not to mention the calls to action that there are specifically to sports. And, um, you know, and, and I think about media responsibility. Uh, I know a lot of people keep pushing for me to monetize. And I kind of feel like if you do that, then you really are click baking, baking or click baiting. And I don't want to do that. Like these are real issues that I wish mainstream uh, media would talk about. And they just refuse to do it in a, I don't know if ethical is the right way. I know they think they have ethics, but I see the reports uh, from the MMIW uh, inquiry and such that really talk about, you know, gendered violence and how we talk about it and how we report it. And I've never seen media care enough to implement any of the um, media calls to action or calls to justice, which, uh, you know, speaks a lot of the uh, racism and anti-Indigenous bias. But I mean, that would help everybody because gendered violence, um, it's its bigger than just misogyny. It's that homophobia, transphobia. And uh, yeah, yeah, we're just allowing it to perpetuate. And the fact that that's never said by any of the interviewers and such like I know they think they're ethical but it's hard for me to see them as ethical when they're yeah. like clearly so biased and and excluding so many voices well I I feel like it, it it's very disappointing because I feel like media in a sense has lost its way in that they think that their job is to report whatever's happening and and that's not journalism that's just yelling into the streets stuff that's happening a journalist is there to provide context and to provide truth in a sense if one person there, there's an old saying if one person says it's raining and one person says it's not the journalist's job is not to say to report both the journalist's job is to stick their head out the window and see who's right yeah. and and i guess most recently that was what was really disturbing with me with some of the reports that i've seen about the big rallies that happened last month again against queer people uh was the the face value that they would report things that they're they're just repeating the talking points of people who are completely anti-queer completely anti anti-trans and often deeply anti-indigenous as yeah. well yeah. and and they're saying oh well it's parental rights the end and you're like well wait is it like if it's parental rights, did you also want to include the clip from the young child who was yelling that gays are disgusting? Did you also want to put out the the post? Why didn't you put any signs from the posters up there that were showing all the homophobic hate, all the transphobic hate? You omitted those yeah. to buy into their narrative. So all I'm saying is like, why not show the whole narrative? You're well, showing what they want you to show, which is the parental rights argument. But then you've edited out all of the other things that show the homophobia that we are charging them with because we're seeing it. And by editing that, that stuff out, they're putting their finger on the scale. They're not even just saying, here's what's happening. They're not even looking deeper and saying, well, are they really concerned about parents' rights or are they concerned about something else? So they're not even they're not even doing that reporting and they're not even showing the whole picture to show the homophobia on the other side, which is just wildly it's wildly negligent. Oh, and then absolutely. They're going, to wring their, they're going to wring their hands and say, "We you know when, when this violence escalates, and we know it does. Always, they're going to wring their hands and say, 
how did this happen? And I'm going to point my finger at Canadian journalists and media and say, it's you. You did this. Yeah. You're amplifying it. Yeah. And then obviously we have to look at P Pierre Polyver and the CPC. And like, I, I completely believe that the Conservative Party of Canada adopting uh, open transphobia as a policy the issue and then a week later that parental rights all across the country happened i i can't see those as as Unrelated. not related like, like they have to be yep 100 yeah. percent. and that and absolutely that context that you said like i can pull my daughter from school any time like any time so like sure. why aren't they telling that yeah. story why aren't they telling the the national laws of discrimination yes. the provincial laws of discrimination yeah. because and back to what you're saying about that overall arching view of it they're not doing that right now and i yeah i'm i'm scared i'm scared for you i'm scared for everybody because <laughs> god forbid what what's going to happen here i remember like in the 90s being afraid leaving boys town knowing there were rednecks waiting to pounce yeah. and beat the crap out of us anytime and um gay bash Right? used to be a very popular thing. Right. I, I know we're back to yeah. that now because I know people are getting it already. And uh, the Inglewood uh, thing, action that we've been doing is literally because yeah. there has been folks that are being doxxed and followed. Their phone numbers are uh, being called. So there's, our community. violence. Yeah. And that that there's, is violence. There's yes. Physical violence. Too. One of my one of my friends was attacked by one of their protesters. Uh they live in the area and one of their protesters like attacked them with a sign. Uh one of our one of our sides who was out there just kind of counter protesting had like hot coffee thrown on them by one of the protesters, and there's there's nothing. Like there's nothing that happens. And it's and it's sad because I've been in so many conversations with CPS, with bylaw, with the mayor's office, with count city councilors, and everyone throws their hands up and says there's nothing they can do. And the and it comes down to the to CPS won't enforce it. Like there are hate laws, there are anti hate hate laws, there are all sorts of things that they could do to make these go away. And whenever people say like, "Hey, you got to do this," they say, they say, "Oh, well, I don't feel safe to do that." I'm like, "You're the cops. If what do you what do you mean you're not safe? We've got you know gray hair oh lesbians and." And, you know, 20 year old young kids out here is fighting for our survival. You've got stab vests on, you've got tasers, you've got all this stuff. And you're saying you can't clear 20 guys off the street corner. And, and it's interesting to me as well, because the national protests, not that I'm advocating for like more cops or anything like that. Don't get me wrong. I'm just pointing out the hypocrisy of them because the national protests demonstrated that in other locations, they absolutely can do these things. Mm -hmm. If you look at Ottawa police officers, well, we don't want you on Parliament Hill. Those guys are gone. Yeah, you know, in Vancouver, in Toronto, we've seen multiple times where officers will step in to get these hate people off the street. But in Calgary, they wring their hands and say, "Well, I, you know, we only get half a billion dollars. I don't think we could do it." Like to serve and protect who? Exactly. Constant vigilance on what? Right, right. Yeah. Like I. Ay, ay, ay. I'm so angry. I've I seen the um, Calgary Foundation quality of life uh, report come out and I talked about it yesterday in my podcast and I kind of mentioned it a bit today. And uh, they do talk about, you know, how unsafe folks feel with their gender diversity, 88%. Um, and they they lumped in racialized and and such and that. So I was going to try to dig deeper to see like what is it they found because um, I mean those things should be segregated as like religion etc. Because yeah. is is it eighty eight percent because they asked a bunch of white Christians are do you feel like you're religiously per persecuted <laughs> and they said absolutely, <laughs> which is ridiculous Nobody. ridiculous. Nobody yeah. loves to be more persecuted than a, a, a white Christian in Canada. They're like, <laughs> oh no, they're like, it, it's, it's bad. I also, I guess I'm losing sympathy for, for like white Christian cishet folks that continue to stand by and say, well, that's not what I believe. And I'm like, well, this is being done in your name. Yeah. Like, no, I've been blocking them actually. Cause I, I can't negotiate with well, that. Sure, like, like you can't. Like I call them kind of the Christmas, the Christmas Christians, you know, like the people who show up on Christmas and Easter. And if they're asked in a survey, will say they're Christian. 
question, but otherwise, like they don't really engage with it all that much. Um, um, you know, like it's those people who swell the ranks of how many Christians are out there. And it's like, do you just do this because it's like a cultural practice more? Like that's just what you do at this time of year. Then do you really believe in this? And if you do, and if you're comfortable, you know that in your name, these actions are happening. And if you're not comfortable with it, you have to speak out about it. It's not enough to say, oh, shucks, that that's too bad. That's not what I think. Well, then stop it. It's happening in your name. You got to You have to take responsibility for that. Well, for me, I, I asked them a question about reconciliation. Like, what is your church doing for reconciliation? Um, if they legitimately care about reconciliation, why aren't they, um, you know, showing off their committees and what work that they're doing and teaming up with other grassroots organizations and listening to Indigenous voices and implementing calls to justice and calls to action. And that is like this massive, like, oh my God, I think I said the wrong thing. And I'm like, yeah, that's what I yeah. thought, block. <laughs> and it's so funny because I think, I think, from our different experiences as someone who's very active in the, the you know, advocating with the queer community and somebody who's very active in, for indigenous calls to justice. It, it's just like this very interesting commonality that you get of like disappointing allies that, that don't, that don't get where they're falling short. And it's hard because I know that there's people who like are in that group that then later get it and later do become, more active and do become more conscious and do make this more of a practice rather than something that they profess but when you said that about like well what are you doing I actually currently live like directly behind a church and they're like a very like liberal squeaky clean kind of appearing church like it looks like an H&M lookbook explodes all over my street every Sunday <laughs> with these like very clean cut like like couples walking their 2.5 children to church and they do bouncy castles and a stampede <laughs> breakfast and things like this and then we asked them like once because they shut down our whole street so we have no choice but to stampede because they have this thing all over our street and so we asked them when you're like so what is your opinion on the queers and they're like we're still figuring it out and this year they they let us know that they've taken the decisive step that during pride they had the lights on their church in pride colors. There's three lights and they had them alternate. So you had no idea that these were even on. And they did it in June when the lights were on for three hours in the middle of the night <laughs> from like midnight to three. And they were like, did you see? <laughs> like, no, funny enough. <laughs> no, funnily enough, I wasn't there at three in the morning to count as your three lights rotated to be like, oh, that is the pride colors. I didn't. And they were like, huh? Huh? Allies? Huh? We got it this year. But it, it's interesting <laughs> to me because I feel like there's a lot of businesses, there's a lot of organizations that do that yeah. to say they're doing something. Mm -hmm. So that like when they're asked, what are you doing? They can say, hey, we lit up our church in pride colors. Yeah. But when you dig down into the reality of it, it's three lights at three in the morning in June when no one sees it, you know? And it's like, <laughs> I, I do a lot of work in diversity, equity, inclusion with companies and, and you know, they all have resource groups and talks and courses and people do get a lot out of it. And, and I do change minds and I do get more information to people, but they're never made mandatory. Mm -mm. They'll never make them mandatory. They'll never say everyone has to get this. Yeah, It's always optional. And that means that, realistically 75 percent of the people that i talk to at these dei classes i'm preaching to the choir yeah to use a religious term i'm i'm talking to people who already get it and maybe i'm expanding that knowledge but i i feel like i've got to get into more rooms where i know people don't think the way i do and i know those are dangerous and i know they take a huge emotional toll on anybody who steps into those rooms yeah. but it's like you know, I, I'm, I'm taking somebody who's already at a B plus and trying to get them to an A minus, which is good and helpful. Yeah. But we've got to start getting the people who are getting failing grades on, on on understanding the wider world around them. And if we can get even get that person into a, a low pass, <laughs> that yeah. can be a lot more safety. And it, it's it's so scary out there. It really is. And I don't know if there is a magic solution, because I feel like if there's one easy 
fix, we would have found it by now, but. Yeah. Well, I, I find that people purposely avoid them. Like, cause we have oh, yeah. answers like the next uh, two um, book clubs that we have is like the, the national action plan on tackling gendered violence. And it's like a 400 page report. Yeah. So we got to break it into two okay. months in order to try to, Same. you know, narrow it down and that was after months and months of doing the national inquiry who the hell is going to read these reports nobody so i always hope that by doing like a podcast of them that maybe that that makes it more accessible for other folks who are interested in some capacity of learning what whatever these three people learned about it you know um willing who are willing to speak you know, up, you know. i wonder if um uh, because people's attention span are so short we have so much going on um, I wonder if doing something like um, five, like five takeaways, like, like, obviously, there's so much to talk about, but as like a way to just get people aware of it and just start more interesting, like five, sh like shocking things or five things you didn't know, you know, like, yeah. you know, like maybe just like distill it down to just a couple of takeaways. And then hopefully people pick up the actual document and start grappling with it. Mm -hmm. That one, I felt like they did a really bad thing and and you're going to be shocked to hear me say I think that they could have list, learned from indigenous people because I feel like the 94 calls to action in the TRC is so well presented yes. it's so clear-cut it's so digestible and so many of these other reports are just you know I have to I, I plow through them because I have to stay abreast of this stuff but it's yeah. They don't make it easy. They don't want that to, that's not really designed to make change. Not the way that they presented that thing. It's, you and I know it's like some academic with a PhD who uses academic language for 400 pages, right? Like, and, and that's, uh, it's Nova Cave. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it's like, it's on the other hand, it's also like vital life saving, like a roadmap forward. And I guess, I guess it is exciting to me because I feel like we've, you know, you can look back through time and you can look at periods of like major changes. You can look at the civil rights movements of the 1960s. You can look at calls for more indigenous voices in the 90s. You know, there are moments that come around when society tries to push things forward. I really feel we are in one right now, which is why we're fear seeing so much backlash mm -hmm. because a white cis heteronormative patriarchy rooted in misogyny, rooted in racism, colonialism, transphobia, they're not just going to give up. They're not just going to be like, oh, oh, you got us. Okay, crap. You know what? You We're just like waiting. Like, it's not like hide and seek and we found them and they're like, you win. Yeah, no, I wish it was. Yeah, Speaking of what which. We're doing. Yeah. <laughs> they're going to push back. They're going to yeah. push back, you know? Like, there's going to be, there's going to be a death rattle of this system. There's going to be, the people who benefit from it are going to fight for those powers as hard now as they did when they stole them earlier mm -hmm. and it's up to us to continue the pressure and continue the march forward but i i do feel like there's more support than ever before i just think that it's about mobilizing it i do think more people than ever before agree on queer issues and are taking more interest in indigenous issues is it enough no but it's it's i think it's still important to celebrate like it is more it is bigger. I can live an openly trans lifestyle in Calgary, Alberta. You couldn't say that always, you know? I I do have the ability to have a really great life here. I face hardships because of that, but more people than ever either don't care or are supportive, and that's really cool. And it's just like keeping that momentum going because now there's more pushback mm -hmm. as, you know, if you looked at it, if you were a, a person who benefited from the older system and you had 10 opportunities and now you look around and say oh well a, an indigenous person took one and a, and a muslim person took one and a queer person took one and now i only have you know like six opportunities instead of 10 that looks like discrim that feels like discrimination to them instead it's actually an adjustment back to more equitable distribution of power you should have never had the 10 but try getting them to see that they were already undue privileged and now we're creating a better balance for that group it does feel like i'm being discriminated against even though they need the broader context mm. I, I want to ask you about bystander intervention um in every one of my sure. podcasts i talk about bystander intervention i give resources 
And yet yeah. you and I see the ramifications of people not standing up and, and then people being targeted with some sort of like, whether it's verbal hate, physical hate, and then, you know, there being tons of witnesses, but none of them stopping to stay, um, you know, giving that information to police, stopping and intervening in any capacities to de-escalate the situation. Like, have you ever really heard of effective uh, bystanders and like what, because I, I just am so tired of having to take my ribbon skirt and put it in my purse on the C train because I know the C train ride, um, I will absolutely be harassed every time I wear a ribbon skirt. Um, and I imagine for your community, very different situation, but the same type of thing where, you know, if <laughs> you're going to get harassed. Yeah. I, I have seen effective bystander intervention because I've done it. <laughs> <laughs> for other people um and there's a there's a, a there's a thing that happens in performing when you are asking somebody in a crowd to do something like you're trying to get a whole crowd on board and you ask somebody to like start dancing it's actually easier to get the first person to start dancing one person who's a free thinker who's like i want to dance they're going to just jump up and start doing it the hardest thing about getting a crowd going is actually the next person. Mm -hmm. If two people go, they'll all go. People are fine to watch one little isolated thing happening. But if there's a chain reaction, and that's what I think is so important is we need bystander chains so that it's not just one person jumping in. It's four or five or six. You know, there's a whole chain of bystanders. So if one bystander gets flat, there's another one supporting them. And another one supporting them. And and it's about building that link of protection. Uh, you know, bystander intervention can be, I think, hard because it shocks people when they see it. You know, like we're we're kind of tricked into this idea that Canada's a nice, polite society and this kind of thing just doesn't happen here. <laughs> and I've heard that till I'm blue in the face. Well, this is not the Calgary that I know. And you're like, which Calgary are you Lock. live in? Is it just Lock. <laughs> Is that what you want? Like, you know? But I get tired of that. I yeah. feel like, see, I feel like bystanders ha generally happen at a higher rate when they are more aware. Like when somebody is able to diagnose an anti-Indigenous slur, when they are able to diagnose an anti-Black slur or anti-queer slur or something like that, and they, they're they like, they're more aware, they'll catch it and act. And I think what we're seeing without that is, how is is the rampant unconsciousness of society that so many people who think that these aren't issues because they've been taught they're not they've been taught canada is this wonderful place that these things don't happen here look we we put the orange shirt on on the right day we put the rainbow up on the right day everything's good right and and what we're trying to do is get people out of that complacency that everything's okay hey and say hey, look it's not all terrible no 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 you, you can take pride in this place but that pride needs to say, live up to the ideals. Yeah. If you are proud to live here, then make it the best you can for as many people as you can. Yeah. Make it yeah. just, make it live up to the standards, you know, that we were, I was certainly taught in the 80s and 90s in Alberta about how great this place is and how we're the cultural mosaic, not the melting pot. You can be who you want here. And it's like, those, <sighs> those national myths have power and they keep people complacent to not see the problems. And then they kind of feel like, well, if I see the problems, does that mean that it's all terrible and it all has to go and it all has to be ripped down? And it's like, probably a lot of it. Yeah. But we can build something better and isn't that good. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I love that. I would, I, I know a lot of people ask me about hope and uh, I always think that's a really privileged question to ask somebody but I do try to find hope. And like, for example, my um, daughter and, and the next generation, you know, they have representation that I was never afforded in any capacity, having the TRC so accessible, having the internet and having all of these reports available to people. It's so easy to like, you know, put and take a, an argument and say, here's everything is that's wrong with what you said. Here's like four articles to back why it's wrong. And um and educate people but you know so like I, I know that it's better than it was when I was growing up yeah. when you had to like 
you know, go to the library from nine to four thirty on Monday through uh, Saturday, you know, with your library card. <laughs> it's a it's a different world. It's such a different world. But um, you know, what 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 does give you hope? What are things that um, is hopeful or oh, or possibilities? I'm full of yeah. hope. I I face lots of. I mean, yesterday I got featured on something online for Bound Pride and just hate, just just wall of hate, you know. Uh, although n you don't know hate until you get, I got featured once on a Western Standard article Ooh. on Twitter. Yeah. That one was bad. This one, yeah, whatever. But even in the face of all of that, I'm still filled with hope. I am. And I just, it's my community. It's when I can gather up a room of 50, 60 queer people and they can celebrate who they are are unapologetically and hold their partner's hands and make out in the corners of the bar and I'm just like get it we did it you know we can make these spaces and things like pride when I I've been lucky enough to to write a pride float for a very supportive law firm that's very like very pro-queer they're one of the first law firms to take on queer clients uh Norton Rose Fulbright they're they're very lovely and they put us on the pride fl pro float every year me and my wife and we get to ride down and just the throngs of thousands of people cheering us on it was just so amazing they were so amped up and the crowds were even bigger than last year and last year was huge and and that to me is so important to remember how many people are on our side yeah i remember you know, the other side that, that's angry they have to drive for three hours around just to get 20 people like they're driving from all over yeah. southern alberta to find 20 angry people to yell at us and, and then I think about how many thousands showed up to celebrate Pride this year. And I'm like, okay, we do have the numbers on our support. It is a very loud, small minority, but we still, I try to keep it in context and I try to keep doing it for the people that, that show up, the community that supports me. Like that's what keeps me going, keeps me hopeful and, and, and working with the younger generation of queer people. And we're also working with the older generation to see how much better I have it than they had it gives me a sense of progress mm -hmm. and to see how free a lot of these kids are to express themselves in a way that I wasn't at that age makes me also aware of the progress and that keeps me going it, yeah I guess that's where I get a lot of my hope from I I think of a camp firefly and just want to cry because like yeah that's that's the progress that little kids who were like I don't even know what trends is can be like yeah. whoa here are binders like they understand the concept after the end of it um when they were going through all of this like inner term turmoil and being unable to label it uh obviously that's why i think sogi is so important uh some people say sogi one two three what am i missing there by saying just sogi do you know uh so sogi is just sexual orientation gender identity and yeah. it is a, they can just refer to any like just that concept yeah. But then within an educational context, there are uh, school programs that are called SOGI 1, 2, 3. So there's like different levels of okay. education on that. So for like younger kids, it's, it's very, very simple. And then it progresses higher up. So that's like saying it's the equivalent of being like um, math 10, math 20, math 30. Yeah. It's it's That's where the 1, 2, 3 comes from. Yeah, sounds good. So I can just say the math part and, and I'm not really... Yeah diminishing the purpose of it and I, and I don't want to the opposite I think it's really important I advocate for it okay. and I know uh, we were asked to write the CDE and um, by that Q, QCR QCW QCU, QCU yeah uh, to do that so QCU. that was Curious Citizens United QCU. ah that's the one and and they asked us to write letters of support to our school trustees for SOGI and I think it's really important we do because um you know I've been putting that out on on my podcast and in the hopes that people will consider writing those letters and reminding back to what you said you know if thousands of people showed up for pride we want those people to write those letters so that they definitely outweigh the you know bots that are sending them in my god so th that's a, a big part of that hope and i'll never forget when we went down uh fourth avenue for the first time maybe 2016 and i've seen thousands of people for the first time when normally it was just like a few hundred on like eighth avenue <laughs> yeah. that gave me that yeah. uh like tears were like coming i'm like oh my god look how many people are here so that was really important well, I mean to me I was there for multiple rallies 
in the summer of 2020 when Black Lives Matter Calgary was holding big rallies. And I was there for the one that was the largest demonstration in Calgary's history. And and it it it's those kinds of things that give me hope mm -hmm. that maybe it's hard to get all those people out and maybe it takes a disaster, which is a tragedy, which is tragic in its own nature, but that that many people would come together and say, this is wrong. That's still a positive sign. Now, it's hard because it's frustrating as an organizer because you're like, let's do that every time. Let's get everybody out every time and we can fix this so fast. Now, yeah. <laughs> you know, but I also think, I also think that like, the system that oppresses us also doesn't give us the bandwidth to voice what's important to us. You know, like just existence under this capitalist system is soul crushing, is time crushing, and it's only gotten worse this year uh, with just corporate greed jacking the prices on everything. And then the Canadian government making the total wrong decision to be like, oh, it must be people are spending too much money. So it's like they made it worse when it's like, no, it's corporate greed they just jacked their prices by 10% because they figured they could. Yeah. And we just all said, yeah, that nobody looked at that where it's really coming from. You know, it's those kinds of things that keep people down so they don't have the strength to protest. Yeah. And I think it's important to remember that people are just trying to survive in their own right and being able to muster that extra step to stand up for the values that you want is a lot for a lot of people. And I try to be empathetic to it, even as I'm also out there trying to pull them out of their homes to come to come to another another rally. Uh, I am a part of QCU that was a part of that campaign. Um, and QCU was originally created around the drag protests. Mm -hmm. So what happened was there was a lot of our events that were getting targeted, a lot of drag events that were getting targeted last year in April and in, in the spring of last year. And we really tried to pull things together to make it safer. Oh, geez, was it this year? Anyways, I'm losing track of time. It might've been this year. Um, and and so it was actually a lot of drag performers and people attached to the shows that originally got together to form QCU mm -hmm. um, to protect drag shows. And then as the hate has kind of morphed into this uh, we're looking to expand a little bit and kind of change our focus and become a little bit of a broader organization. But that's where it originally started. Um, and then, you know, we, we're kind of getting overwhelmed or we're trying to organize all these counter protests because every time Larry Heather decides he wants to hate some queer people, it's it's hard to be like, OK, everyone put down our lives. We have to go defend our existence again. We have to do this three times a week now. Like no other group has to do this. And it's taken its toll on our community. So we're trying to find a way to to still show support without exhausting and traumatizing people. Because there's a lot of people who came out to protests a year ago that just can't, can't do it anymore because they've been, they just had too much hate thrown at them and it wears them out. So we need new people to come out. So we're trying to expand that group a little bit uh, in the next coming weeks. Uh, there is also the major protest that's happening next Saturday on the 21st. Uh, so QCU and a lot of other queer focus groups are are hoping for a major show of strength. So we're going to be pulling a lot of people out, hopefully uh, between noon and four on the 21st. I will be there by one. Uh, so we're kind of hoping to have a good show of strength and and kind of celebrate queer life and kind of ignore them as much as possible. And not, But also just be like, we're here. We're not going anywhere. You can shout at us all you want, but we're not, we're not going anywhere. Uh, community care is like a major issue. I, I face it all the time. Our community is really divided because of all of the trauma and the lack of resources, especially cultural resources. And uh, yeah, I, I am definitely down for whatever uh, community care can look like for the community because I am like, shit, I'm, I'm straight and cis. And having for five hours little kids fingering at you and you know telling you all sorts of awful things like it that hurt my heart that day for two days I, oh, I was wow. like man that, that sucked <laughs> let alone if I was actually trans if I was actually in the queer community identifying in that way you know yeah so. yeah it's uh it's a hard one uh, another thing that I'm pulling together to support the queer community is there's going to be a, a large uh, Trans Day of Remembrance ceremony this year. Uh, that's going to be happening at Central Memorial Park, looks like. Um, we're going to be doing a 24-hour fire vigil. Um, so we're going to start at 12.01 and go to 11.59 p.m. 
and uh, we'll be going all day. And then there's going to be like some speeches and kind of a, a moment of reflection in the in the afternoon, evening. Um, but that's been getting a lot of support. There's a lot of people who are on board uh, to support that community. So I'm hoping that we can kind of get a lot of people out. And it's it's a pretty heavy one this year about the amount of violence that the communities face. So I think doing something something like that, just having a moment where you can come and reflect and come and just be around supportive people might be helpful and put a warm drink in you at least and <laughs> just hang out for a bit. Yeah, I'm really excited for that. I've been talking about it on my podcast because it's really important that we all all do that. So uh, first of all, thank you. And if there's anything I can do, always let me know. I want to amplify whatever oh, work it. it is you're doing. And then that bigger picture. Um, yeah. Is there anything else you want to add for today? Um, on a on a lighter note, if you would like to laugh the the blues away, I did just release uh, my first ever comedy album. Uh, so if you want, it's on Spotify and iTunes. Uh, you can search my name, Carla Marx, Carla with a K, Marx with an X. Uh, it's called Well Okay Then. Uh, and if you want to hear some funny things from a trans femme comedian, uh, give it a listen. Oh God, yes, I'm absolutely doing that right right <laughs> away. I'm so excited about it. I'll promote it right away. Um, okay, well that's great, and that makes me happy because yeah, I think the best way I don't know you have to use humor for all this ridiculousness it's just because it is so ridiculous like you can't you can't help but make jokes about it so yeah I really yeah. appreciate you coming on talking to me about some of the things that oh in a second and if you need to come back anytime please know you are more than welcome and I also want to give a shout out to Taylor McNally who right now is in the Calgary court system um for folks who uh follow stop the stack YYC they have been talking about it, but her tweet this morning was, I'm preparing for the possibility of receiving a harsher sentence than Alex Dunn, the Calgary police officer found guilty of assaulting a handcuffed black woman by slamming her face first into concrete. And the whole reason we were outside the courthouse for 14 days in 2021. And uh, I think it's really important that everybody supports Stop the Stack, YYC, in the hopes that we can help Taylor McNally and Adora Newfer in these racially targeted, um, you know, justice charges, uh, injustice charges. <laughs> and uh, hopefully she's doing okay, but my heart is broken for her. And I'm sad that so many folks aren't seeing this injustice for what it is. So I'm thinking about her and I know um, it's important that we support our Black um, activists that are doing that Black Lives Matter activism. Um, yeah, and with that, yeah, I, I am I'd going just to... like to echo my support for them. Um, you know, we don't always see eye to eye, uh, Taylor and I, but I have absolute support for her in this, that the way that the legal system, the way that the cops have targeted her, it is obviously a very directed campaign in an attempt to silence a voice that has always tried to hold CPS accountable for the continued anti-black racism that happens and uh and what they're doing to Taylor is absolutely wrong and if you can support her uh if you can help to her legal aid funds she's she needs help because they are indeed stacking these charges in a deliberate attempt to silence her and uh Taylor is such an important voice in this community constantly advocating for her community uh, in, in, you know, the most unapologetic way. And if that can happen to a, a vibrant leader like Taylor, it can happen to any of us. And, and if you're an advocate for any kind of social justice, any kind of progress, it's important to remember that what is happening to Taylor, it could be any one of us right now. And, and we need to show solidarity. Yes, a hundred percent. I, uh, I'm proud that this podcast has given solutions and included cultural safety or cultural first aid in all of them to try to create a safer space for Indigenous people of color, those with disabilities, and 2SLGBTQ to speak. According to the 2023 Quality of Life Report from the Calgary Foundation, 88% of racialized Calgarians feel uncomfortable or out of place because of their religion, ethnicity, skin color, culture, language, accent, gender, or sexual orientation, which is up from 75% in 2022. So in just a year, we've had a huge shift like that. Uh, 
84% of racialized Calgarians believe that racism exists versus 66% of non-racialized Calgarians. Imagine being 33% of Calgarians thinking there's no such thing as racism. Thank you, authors Cheryl Ward and Chelsea Branch and Alicia Fritkin of heretohelp.bc.ca of what is Indigenous cultural safety and why I should care about it. Their work and those cultural action tools are available, so please support work like that as part of your reconciliation and settler understandings. I'm just lucky enough to highlight and repeat them here. Internalized racism, lateral violence, internalized oppression is another form of violence Indigenous and equity-seeking groups experience by the structure of oppression imposed on these lands. Donna Bevins has a wonderful website called racialequitytools.org with many resource files, including what is internalized racism. So I highly recommend it for anybody in equity seeking groups, because um, one of the things that we're seeing is the intersectional issues of oppressing another group while still trying to advocate for another, as we talked about earlier. So if we all do that work, then we won't be oppressing it, uh, any of us as we move forward. Do's and don'ts for bystander intervention by American Friends Service Committee, so AFSC.org. Uh, um, I wish anyone who follows me on social media would watch the anti-racism organizational lead for the city of Calgary. Um, the committee gave a presentation on the journey of becoming an anti-racism leader, and it's just on YouTube. It's available for everybody. Um, of course, we just talked about Taylor McNally and Adora Nufour, our, our um, Black Lives Matter activists. Please go to Stop the Stack YYC to learn more about why this is so important and be able to donate directly to them. Indigenous people have been talking about our issues, sharing our traumas in reports, commissions, and public hearings, just so it can be regularly disregarded. No more. Honor our words. Honor the treaties. Listen to politicians in their platforms and policies if they don't recognize oppression in their budget with gender equity plus, uh, if they're cutting violence prevention programs, services, Indigenous education, refusing to search a landfill, um, uterus health choices, gay straight alliances, lack for human rights for migrants, immigrants, folks with disabilities. Know that your vote to that person or party directly negatively impacts um, equity seeking people. Demand that they implement the Truth and Reconciliation Commission calls to action, the recommendations of the Royal Commission on Aboriginal peoples, the multiple reports about child welfare reform, violence prevention, and now the 231 calls to justice from the National Inquiry on missing and murdered Indigenous women, girls, and two-spirit. Provincially, the Kenny government created 113 pathways to justice. So that's a provincial a report that all Albertans should be pushing the new Premier's Council on Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and Girls on. Um, municipally, we have the White Goose Flying Report, literally a dead person who had to be relocated. So for anybody who's like, there's no coffins, it's like literally Jack White Goose Flying exists. So that just shows me you didn't read the report. Anyway, denying these reports is a form of abuse called gaslighting. Our people are experiencing extreme racism in every institution with multiple reports to show the same thing. Uh, demand change from election platforms and politicians if they don't understand colonialism, racism, privilege, and sexism. They literally have zero business running, which is really difficult when all of the parties have come out with exactly the same talking points on colonialism abroad. Um, this should be understood by all parties, local politicians, community organizations, sports clubs, etc. Google articles on how non-Indigenous Canadians can become allies. Uh, a wonderful organization that uh, I support, thanks to Stephanie Harp, is aboriginalalert.ca. I try to reshare all the missing and murdered Indigenous women, girls, and two-spirit from there. Many men are also on there as well. Uh, Missing Children's Society of Canada is trying to become more Indigenous inclusive, so you can download their app as well. Um, a really wonderful uh, statement came out from womenshomelessness.ca, the demand, the urgent action of protecting the lives of Indigenous women, girls, and two-spirit and gender diverse people experiencing homelessness, which we know is disproportionate for us thanks to the hate of religion and parents kicking out their own kids. Um, yesterday, uh, Ian Thompson tweeted out the province has published data for July and updated the June fig figure. It has already climbed 5.3% to 170 deaths in just two weeks. 
July has been reported to 168 deaths and expected to climb as well. So the drug poisoning deaths in Alberta remain high. Our new records are set and uh, Edmonton CTV News just put out all of that information as well. So this drug crisis is um, substantial. If you are using, please don't use alone. If you are using alone, contact the uh, National Overdose Response Service at 888-688-NORS for support or download the Brave or Doors app. Their lifeguard also has an app and create a safety plan so that you don't die because your life matters. If you are experiencing emotional distress after anything we talked about today and need to talk, you can call the First Nation and Inuit Hope for Wellness helpline at 855-242-3310. It is open 24 hours a day, seven days a week. They also have a website, hopeforwellness.ca, with a little text box if that's more uh, accessible for you. For missing and murdered Indigenous women, girls, and two-spirit, you can call 844-413-6649. It is also a 24-7 crisis line. And we have a 60 Scoop March coming up here in October. Um, I shared the poster. I hope you all consider going. And we're also looking for volunteers and donors. Uh, Indian Residential School Survivor and Family Hotline, 866-925-4419. And the Native Youth Crisis Hotline is 877-209-1266. For non-Indigenous, there are distress center lines in your area, usually a functioning 211, or you can call 833-456-4566 and text at 45645, or go to crisisservicescanada.ca. Kids help phone 1-800-668-6868. Even I'm so old, even I use that number. Um, the following are two SLGBTQ crisis support lines. Uh, you can go to lifevoice.ca. The trans lifeline is 877-330-6366. And the Trevor Project for two uh, SLGBTQ youth, 866-844-7386. Violence is my everyday reality. Every Indigenous generation has faced it. This is self-care, media representation, and how I can take my power back. That's why I started this podcast, to speak freely without interruption, without tone police, leadership shaming, gaslighting questions. So many people don't want to hear my opinion, but sure want to tell us theirs, even though if they know nothing about us, colonialism, the constant surveillance of our people, protests, vigils, and our rights. I and many others share uh, microaggressions daily, so it's just unacceptable anymore to say these things. Learn about being trauma-informed. Folks like me are dealing with internalized racism and gatekeeping. Folks that survive off the status quo or so are so in their trauma that they stop people from doing the work and deplete personal resources, like the leader that was talking yesterday. Internal and external racism is an everyday reality for me, Indigenous people, folks with disabilities, QT BIPOC, and others. Masi Cho to my ancestors, to my late granny and my mom of what strength looks like through your example. I want to thank my dad for teaching me to be strong and blunt. My stepmom for showing me what a proud culture is through her Austrian family and roots and stepping up to teach me to be a proud Calgarian is through her. I'm a second generation proud Calgarian. To my husband Darcy uh, for producing and editing this show on top of being my husband, childhood friend, father of our child and my support down the journey of this red road. He has witnessed decades of racism and sexism. And to our child, we are blessed that you picked us and that we get to learn from you daily. You give me daily accountability to be a better and a stronger person. And I hope my daughter and my family will be proud in the future of us trying to discuss these present day issues. My Patreon account is Native Calgarian where you can go and pledge and support. Thank you previous donors for showing your support. If you value listening or watching and can afford to give, thank you. For those who cannot afford to give, I'd love to hear from you at nativeyyc at gmail.com, where you can send in your comments or questions. You can also subscribe to my YouTube channel, or you can go to nativecalgarian.com for the latest podcast or to hire me. I just want to say thanks a million times over, but I always want to end with side eye to those Calgary rabbits. You're lucky I'm not tradish. And my beautiful cousin would respond, are you being my dish? Thanks, folks, for listening. And thank you, Carla, for being my guest.